Turner hymn number, hymn number 26. Hymn number 26. Come thou found. Because he lives, 805, let's stand as we sing.
Sheila. I got you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There are quite a few churches throughout our country that are being targeted. They are, un they are under attack. There are pastors being arrested and criminally charged or threatened with prison. There are parishioners that are being threatened by a prosecutor with up to a year in prison for attending church. And uh, all because they want to worship the Lord. Liberty Council has sent uh, a letter and in the letter indicated why tyrants always target churches first. And I thought that was very interesting and I'd like to share it with you. Throughout history, the church has always been a target of tyrants. Just ask Pastor Christian Ionescu. He grew up in communist Romania where Christians were beaten, jailed, or worse for sharing a Bible with a neighbor, worshiping or preaching the gospel. Pastor Christian never dreamed he would face similar persecution in America, but that's what's happening to his church in Chicago. Elam Romanian Pentecostal Church. Like many in his church who escaped communism, he says the tyrannical playbook he faced in Romania is the same one being used against his church today in America. And the first phase of control is always fear. Why is this all happening right now? Well, they go on to talk about themselves a little. Liberty Council is fighting all these battles and many more. I could share dozens more stories of anti-Christian persecution that have taken place this year, all against pastors and churches we represent. And they're not the only ones representing churches, by the way. Which begs the question, why are pastors and churches being singled out and targeted right now? The answer is clear. Throughout history, the Christian church has been the last and best resistance to ungodly government dictates. That's because Christians love freedom and pastors can speak directly to their congregants, bypassing the manipulative fear and control techniques employed by lawless rulers. Tyrants cannot allow another voice to compete with their dictates. They want no God but the state. The same is true in America right now. The fact is the Christian church is the last bastion of true freedom in our nation today. Without the voice of Christians in our society, America will rapidly become anti-God, anti-family, and anti-life Marxist state. In 2016, Christians voted in record numbers and provided the margin of difference in the presidential race. Without the Christian vote, radical Marxists will win every election and the Marxists who want total control know this. <clears throat> I would encourage you that if you are registered to vote, if you aren't registered, I think you still have time, but if you are not registered to vote, you get registered and vote not based on personality, but based upon the platform that people are running on. You only really have two choices to be effective. Either vote against the Marxist ideology that is trying to take over our nation or vote against it. And vote for that which is an attempt at least to preserve our uh, constitutional form of government that we've enjoyed all these years. And so, um, please do your part to vote 
I tell you, the opposition is doing everything in their power, and they have tons of money by George Soros and technical giants and others who uh, are just putting tons of money into this Marxist agenda and the groups that support it. And uh, let me assure you this, money doesn't answer everything. If God's in control, you can spend all the money you want. He's still going to get his way. But God uses instrumentality, and that means you and I need to be out there and vote, and vote the right way. Uh, speaking of that, I uh, had an absentee ballot because at the time I wasn't sure what was going to happen with Rosalie. She had signed up for one. She's gone, so she can't vote. She didn't need to. <coughs> but... Uh, I did get the absentee ballot because I wasn't sure if I'd be able to be there in person. I did go and hand it in at the uh, finance office, though, rather than mailing it. I worked for the post office company for about five years, and uh, I know a lot of people are trying to do their job, but anyway, I'll, I'll just stop there. Uh, I did, in that sense, vote as much in person as I could. There's a built-in system of fraud that they're trying to do through the mail-in system. So if at all possible, vote in person. I would share this. There are some things on your ballot that you will notice if you haven't already voted. Uh, one of the things is that the first thing you vote for is president, but it's confusing. It says presidential electors, and it has names on there underneath the presidents that are, are the candidates for president that don't even need to be there. And I, when I handed it in, I, I complained about this, and she said, I know, but this is what came from the Secretary of State. Those names don't need to be on the ballot. I assure you, that if you vote for the presidential electors, you are voting for which candidate to be president. The others are more clear. Uh, there are some amendments proposed to the Constitution. Uh, this, the one in the middle is an amendment for them to be able to vote on uh, sports teams out in uh, Deadwood. I, and uh, they already are able to gamble on other things, but they want to add sports teams to it. The first one is an amendment to, and, and there has been something mailed out. I don't know if you got it in the mail. It can be a little confusing. There are two on marijuana, the last one and the first one. Uh, the last one is, uh, do you want to vote for the medical marijuana approved? The first one sounds like it's going along with it, but actually the first one, what you're voting for is whether we should allow recreational use of marijuana or not. So I just want you to be aware of that when you vote, so you can vote wisely. All right. Now that we've taken care of all of that stuff, let's get to the good stuff, shall we? Let's go to the Word of God and open our Bibles to 2 Timothy 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now I want to look at verses 5 and 6. Shall we stand as we read together in unison this morning? 2 Timothy chapter 4 verses 5 and 6. Everybody's got it now? All right. Let's read it together. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Father, guide. And I pray that you would 
to speak through your word very clearly and talk to us about the things that you want us to know. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I think most of us are familiar with the term of passing the baton. And uh, in the races, there are certain kinds of races where there are more than, than one runner. Uh, there's more than one runner in the race, and they have to carry a baton. And the, as one runner gets to the point that he's finishing his point, his part of the race, he reaches out with the baton, and the next runner takes that baton and runs with it and does his portion of the race, and you do that until you're, all your runners are done, and then that final one, of course, takes that baton and runs past the finish line, or at least that's the attempt that they make. The Apostle Paul here is, in a sense, passing the baton to Timothy, his uh, protege, his uh, son in the faith, the one that he's been uh, encouraging and instructing in ministry. And uh, he is about to leave the scene of this earth and enter into glory as we see in uh, verse 6, he says, for I'm now ready, and literally it says, I'm already being poured out. And he's picturing the idea of a, a liquid uh, uh, oblation, or part of a sacrifice, that they would pour on the sacrifice before the sacrifice was given. And he says, I'm already being poured out, and I'm about ready to, to end my journey here on this earth. And I'm about ready to depart uh, at this world and be with Christ. And he, so he says, I'm giving these, he's been giving some instructions, and he's, he's just finishing off with this. Here I'm handing the baton over to you, Timothy, and I want you to run with it. So, as we look at this passage today, I want you to see it as, in particular, it addresses those who are in the ministry. So, in a, in a big way, I'm preaching to myself this morning. But each one of us does have an area of Christian service that God has called us to. And in that sense, I believe that you can justly apply these truths to your area of service. And so the message can still be, and should still be, very profitable to you as well. And I think what the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us through this portion, and the Word of God is trying to tell us, is that you should faithfully and courageously carry out the gospel service. I think that's very important today as we see many who have already been carrying out their portion of ministry faithfully over the years and courageously and have fought many spiritual battles to see as to where we are today and they're just passing off the scene. It's just uh, a lot of my spiritual mentors uh, have gone home to be with the Lord. And um, I guess I'm not considered a spring chicken anymore either. And one of these days, if Jesus doesn't come back here real soon, he's going to take me off the scene too. And I uh, have to say this very gingerly, but some of you got some pretty white hair too. And who's going to take the baton? Who's going to run with it when we're gone? I was in 
intern pastor at Ankeny Baptist Church as part of my uh, seminary requirements. And uh, one of the things that they asked me to do was they asked me to get up and running a children's church ministry in that church. And so Rosalie and I were, uh, I was in charge of it, but she helped me out. And we, we got a children's church thing going there, and it was going pretty good. But after I was no longer intern, after not too many years, it sort of petered out. It, it, it wasn't functioning, and I learned something from that. You know, it, it wasn't all that difficult to get some material, to get some helpers, to organize a thing, to uh, have a children's church ministry in Anthony Baptist Church, but my biggest failure was I did not train somebody to take over when I left. And that ministry just sort of died. I, by now, they probably have restarted it with somebody else. But I did not reproduce myself. <coughs> the Apostle Paul, in a sense, is trying to reproduce himself through Timothy. And encourage him. He does it through others as well. But he, he says... I want you to take the baton as I leave this earth of sharing the gospel and fulfilling the gospel ministry and I want you to run with it. Now, as he talks to him, he gives several clear principles, ways on how to do this. And we find them all in verse 5. So, if you can find... First, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 5, and uh, you're in a good spot there because that's where they're found. And the first one you're going to find right away says, Watch thou in all things. Now what he's actually telling him here is to be sober is the word in the Greek. And it's the idea of having a clear head, not being inebriated, not being under intoxication is the... Uh, literally speaking, that would definitely be true, but spiritually speaking, too. So he's saying, stay clear-headed under pressure. Now, in order to do that, there are two aspects that people sort of debate about which one he's really talking about. And I think maybe perhaps both aspects are involved, but primarily this, number one, is to retain spiritual composure. That means to be level-headed, to be self-controlled, to be sensible, to be rational, to be wise. So as these false teachers go about, and as you're under opposition, he's telling Timothy, you remain level-headed under all of that. It's easy to get involved in rash decisions and to let emotions run things. You know, it has been known that there have been herds who stampeded. And some of them irrationally have stampeded themselves over a cliff. One goes over and the other one follows them right over the cliff. And they just keep doing that, and the whole herds have been known to stampede themselves over the side of a cliff. We call this a herd mentality. What drives them to do that? Well, just either merely impulse or emotion, some sort of fear. And... Uh, it, it's easy for a pastor to get involved in impulse uh, reactions and uh, to just go by the emotions, you know. We get people teaching things and they are all on an emotional high and everybody's excited and they're getting involved in these kinds of ministries and the pastor thinks, oh, why isn't that happening in my church? Maybe I need to jump on the bandwagon. And God's saying, wait a minute, hold on. 
Don't you start making rash decisions about these things and don't let the emotions rule your heart. You need to be thinking about this uh, biblically. You need to make sure that it's in conformity with the truth of the Word of God. Now, listen, pastors don't only have that temptation. As we look around as individuals and we see things happening here and there and Oh, this is the popular thing. Everybody else is doing it. It's easy to get involved in the herd mentality, even as people who sit in the pew, isn't it? Well, this church over here is this, uh, this kind of music in their church. And look at all the people they're attracting. Well, yeah, that, that music, if you look at it, is the world's music. It takes some courage to say the truth and to live by it, isn't it? But everybody likes it. Well, yeah. A lot of people are driven by emotion and not thinking clearly. One of the things we used to tell our kids is think. You know, we've lost the art of thinking. We really have. Critical thinking. And I'm not meaning just being cr uh, criticizing everything negatively, but just really thinking things through clearly and biblically. Your thinking should rule your emotions rather than your emotions ruling your thinking. So you need to retain spiritual composure and you need to remain spiritually conscious. Here's the other aspect. Some think it means to be alert or to be watchful and I think both aspects are probably involved. In order to be critical thinkers, we need to be alert and conscious of what's going on. We need to be watchful. There are things that are going to be coming our way, attacks from Satan, temptations of every kind, discouragements, the like that he's been dealing with Timothy and he says, you need to be aware and on watch concerning these things. So think, think biblically and let biblical thinking rule your emotions. Secondly, stand under problems. Endure afflictions. In order to do that, you need to perceive the spiritual warfare that you will always encounter. The Apostle Paul has been fighting a war spiritually. And he's telling Timothy, if you're going to remain firm, if you're going to stand true and firm under these problems that you're going to face, you're going to have to perceive that you are constantly in spiritual warfare. This is not merely a game. Ephesians, he wrote uh, along that lines in Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, he says, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. There is a spiritual warfare going on and there is spirit beings involved in that war, trying to affect, trying to uh, control and, and make people do and be what one side or the other wants them to be or do, God's side or the devil. You're working against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. <coughs> stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. The Apostle Paul says, you're in war, you need to have on your armor, and you need to use it in defense, and then uh, your primary offense, by the way, is prayer. Now the sword also can be used as an offensive weapon, but the sword was also defensive. And up to this point, it was in the context of all these defensive weapons. And then he says, pray. There's something about war, unless it's a very, very short war. I don't know how many of them are all that short. When one battle is over, there's another battle that comes up. In war, the enemy seeks to destroy you and others in numerous battles that are waged over time. Until the war is either won or lost, or they declare nobody's a winner and we just don't have any more money or whatever to fight it anymore. How often in history has that happened, Dean? I don't know, you have to Google that one for me. Uh, here's the thing. You are always constantly in the spiritual state of war. Spiritually speaking, there's always warfare going on. And then you need to persevere in the sufferings for Jesus that you will experience. Suffer affliction. Endure affliction. We're told in the scriptures, you will suffer when you're serving the Lord. And a lot of people are going to count the cost and say, well, if being a Christian is a warfare, and if you're going to suffer for it, I don't want to be a Christian. Listen, the spiritual warfare is going on no matter what. You'll either be on the losing side or the winning side. If you're a Christian, the war has already been won. There are battles that are being fought, but Jesus has won that final war. And let me tell you, if you stay in the devil's side, you're on the loser side. And the outcome isn't good. So whether you like it or not, you're in this war. As you become a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to persevere in the sufferings for Jesus that you will experience. Jesus said, they treat me this way, they're going to treat you this way. The master's been treated that way, his servant's going to be treated this way. All who, uh, we've been told, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Listen, when one spiritual battle is over, fortify yourself for the next one, which will surely come. The third thing is to seek for conversions through preaching. Do the work of an evangelist. Now there was one who was called to be in that position of evangelist, but the work of an evangelist, whether you're called into the evangelism ministry or just considered a pastor, he says, you do the work of an evangelist, which is to share the gospel of salvation. An evangelist is a proclaimer. An evangelist is one who preaches the gospel, that is, to persuade, to speak, to discourse, to expound, to urge people to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. To do that, you expose the people their desperate need of salvation from and victory over sin. Romans 3.23 tells us very clearly, for all have sinned. You come short of the glory of God, Romans 6, 23, the first part. The wages of sin is death. John 3, 
36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Romans 6, 6-14, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Not only are we saved from the punishment, but he's talking here of the very power of sin over our lives. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. So the, the message of salvation is God will save you from the punishment of your sin because uh, and we're going to talk about that mo moment because of Jesus Christ. But he will also save you from its power over your life and give you victory over it. So expose people to their desperate need of salvation from and victory over sin. And explain to people the divine means of salvation from and victory over sin. That means of salvation is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, the good news which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ, died for our sins, according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. For Christ, in 1 Peter 3.18, also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. You see, it was necessary for Jesus to substitute in our place the just one for the unjust ones in order that God's wrath that would be poured out upon sin would be poured out upon him instead of us who deserve it. That he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5 18 through 21, and all things are God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. In sin, we are apart from God. We are enemies of God. God wants to reconcile us to himself. He does that in Christ. And he hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, not counting to them their trespasses, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us. He who knew no sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so we're told that anybody who will repent of their sin and call on Jesus in faith, trusting him to be their savior, he'll save them. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For by grace are you saved through faith. And it's a gift of God. I try, I don't know if I've done 
well at it, but I try, at least in our morning messages, to give the message and the appeal for people to be saved. Even if that's not the main import of the message. That is the work of an evangelist. And if you're here today and haven't been saved, or you're not sure if you've been saved, I would appeal to you that before this day is out, you make sure that you are saved. Ask God to help you evangelize the spiritually lost. And prepare yourself and be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. Be ready so when the Holy Spirit gives you the opportunity and says, here's one I want to, you to talk to, that you're ready to give them. And it's not all that difficult. If you've been saved, do you know how you've been saved? Well, share with them the same thing that you came to realize. <laughs> share your testimony. And point them to the Word of God, to these scriptures. And then for serve to completion your part. And as we talk about the part, he says, make full proof of thy ministry. In other words, complete fully your ministry. His position, his function, his responsibility, his task. And that would be to carry out all the duties of your ministry. Now as a pastor, there are some things that are not too hard to do as far as uh, feeling uncomfortable about it or something like that. But there are some things that just aren't that comfortable to do as a pastor. You remember what we saw before he says reprove, rebuke? Oh, people really love to be reproved and rebuked, right? And so it's not always a comfortable thing to do that. The Apostle Paul says, I have given unto you the full counsel of God. And besides that, it's not only just the preaching, there's the teaching, there's the praying, there's the administration part, uh, there's being an example, there's just the ministry of people with broken hearts and and on and on, he says, you do uh, carry out all the duties of your ministry. Some are pleasant, some aren't. Do them all. And continue for a full duration of your ministry. In other words, don't be a quitter. Carry the baton until you, it's time to pass it on to the next one because you're leaving the scene or until you cross the finish line. Can you imagine, now today we have tractors and things, but it, they used to plow the fields with these animals and the guy would stand there behind this plow holding on to it with the reins or whatever, the straps to control the animal and they'd start going down the field. Now that wasn't easy work. Now some parts of the field were easier if they had been plowed before, but then there's these fields that had rocky places that hadn't been broken up before. Well, the guy can get, go out there and say, man, this is hot, this is, this is tough work. I don't want to do the rocky part, I'll just stop in this part that's already been done before. So he just leaves the plow and <laughs> field's half done. Or even if it wasn't that hard over there, he, just the idea that this is tough work. I'm not getting any real appreciation for all this. So he leaves the plow half done out in the field. He would say that person wasn't very wholehearted and wasn't very reliable. And the apostle is telling Timothy, don't stop in the middle of the work. Don't stop running in the middle of the race. Serve the Lord wholeheartedly and faithfully until God makes it so that you can't serve Him. If I totally lose my mind, I shouldn't be up here. I'm pretty close. Uh... There may be a time when physically I'm no, no longer able or mentally no longer able to minister. And then God will say, 
your ministry, your service in this aspect in any way is done. Maybe the Lord will allow me if Jesus doesn't come first to just continue serving until, until he takes me home in this capacity. But whatever way God chooses, he says, keep on doing the ministry until I say it's done. Your area of service that God has given you, keep on serving him faithfully and courageously until he says, you're done. Listen, in closing, I would I beg you to do something. Pray for more Timothys. People to whom the, the, wand, the baton of spiritual service can be passed on who will run with it. Committed, courageous, correct ministers of the gospel. And I would plead with you to take up the baton of spiritual service and run with it till your race on earth is over. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for the privilege to be your servants when we have put our faith in Jesus Christ to be our Savior. I pray that if there's a soul there today that's not saved, that you'll save them before the day is out. And I pray that you would encourage us as believers to fight this spiritual warfare, to serve you faithfully until you call us home. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing, let's stand and sing this final song. We'll just sing one verse. One verse. And if you need to come during our singing to indicate that you'd like somebody to help you be saved. I can't save you, but I can show you how to be saved. Pray with you. Open the Word of God with you. Or God has spoken to your heart and you need some other spiritual counsel and encouragement, you can come as well. Let's stand and sing 610. Give up your best to the Master. Give of your best to the Master. Give of the strength of your youth. Throw your soul's fresh glowing ardor into the battle for truth. Jesus has set the example. Doubtless was he young and brave. To the master, give of the strength of your youth, clad in salvation.